Second reading this morning is Matthew 6, 5 through 15. And whenever you pray, do not be like hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners so that they may be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But whenever you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. When you are praying, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. Pray then in this way. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy, your name, your kingdom come, you, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also forgive our, have forgiven our debtors. And do not bring us to the time of trial, but rescue us from the evil one. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. I'd like to begin this morning with three short stories. The first took place on October 2nd, 2006, at a one-room schoolhouse in the Amish community of Nickel Mines, Pennsylvania. A lone gunman entered the school building, took hostages, and shot 10 girls ages 6 to 13 killing five before turning the gun on himself. In the midst of their grief over this shocking loss, the Amish community didn't cast blame, they didn't point fingers, they didn't hold a press conference with attorneys at their sides. Instead, they reached out with grace and compassion toward the killer's family. The afternoon of the shooting, an Amish grandfather of one of the girls who was killed expressed forgiveness toward the killer, Charles Roberts. That same day, Amish neighbors visited the Roberts family to comfort them in their sorrow and pain. Later that week, the Roberts family was invited to the funeral of one of the Amish girls who had been killed. And Amish mourners outnumbered the non-Amish at Charles Roberts' funeral. The world was inspired. Our second story took place on December 19th, 2008, just six days before Christmas in Dale City, Virginia. A teenage neighbor and family friend broke into the Smith family home looking for valuables to steal. Surprised by the presence of the Smith's son, he shot him and left. Realizing he'd forgotten his coat, he returned to find Mrs. Smith sobbing over her son's body. What could he do? He was known to the family. So he killed her too. In her powerful story about the incident that some of us watched in our sacred, sacred circles classes last week, daughter Sarah Smith Montana recounts how quickly forgiveness came to her. I told everyone I had forgiven him, and I almost believed it. The world was inspired. 
Our third story took place on June 17, 2015, in Charleston, South Carolina, when a young white supremacist entered the Emmanuel African Methodist Episcopal Church, stayed for an hour and a half of Bible study, then took out a 45 caliber automatic pistol and murdered nine members, including four pastors. Nadine Collier's mother, Ethel Plant, was one of those victims. At the bond hearing two days later, her voice breaking, Nadine addressed the perpetrator. I just want to say, I forgive you. I will never talk to my mother ever again. I will never hold her again, but I forgive you. You hurt me. You hurt other people, but I forgive you. And the world was inspired. Now, I don't know the motivations of any of these inspiring people. We stand in collective awe of their faith and their righteousness. But I chose our scripture reading today because I fear that there is another reason we leap to forgiveness. And I fear it may not be healthy, healing, or holy. I call it the if dilemma. Our text this morning comes from Matthew's great Sermon on the Mount, a treatise on how to live the Christian way. Today, Jesus is talking about prayer. When you pray, he says, don't be like the hypocrites. They love to stand in the synagogues and on the street corners and pray loudly. They want people to see them. The truth is, that's all the reward they will get. But when you pray, you should go into your room and close the door. Then pray to your father. He is there in that private place. He can see what is done in private, and he will reward you. And when you pray, don't be like the people who don't know God. They say the same things again and again. They think that if they say them enough, their God will hear them. Don't be like them. Your father knows what you need before you ask him. So this is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, we pray that your name will always be kept holy. We pray that your kingdom will come, that what you want will be done here on earth, the same as in heaven. Give us the food we need for today. Forgive us our sins, just as we have forgiven those who did wrong to us. Don't let us be tempted, but save us from the evil one. And then, here are the verses. Yes. If you forgive others for the wrongs they do to you, then your Father in heaven will also forgive your wrongs. But if you don't forgive others, then your Father in heaven will not forgive the wrongs you do. If. If you forgive others for the wrongs they do to you, then your Father in heaven will also forgive your wrongs. But if you don't forgive others, then your Father in heaven will not forgive the wrongs you do. Right there in Matthew chapter 6. If, but, all leading to the same conclusion that God's forgiveness is conditional. No forgiveness on your part, no forgiveness from God. Now believe it or not, there is a huge debate in theological circles about this issue. And I 
think it's crucial that we address it because it speaks to what motivates us to forgive and why God wants us to forgive. And at the end of the day, what constitutes a healthy and healing way to forgive? Now, the conditional camp is firm in its belief that God expects us to forgive others even when they don't repent or deserve it. As Sarah Montana says, it's like the Nike version of forgiveness. Just do it. Matthew's gospel on face value agrees, adding, and if you don't forgive, don't expect God to forgive you. Ouch. Ouch. In this scheme, forgiveness is an outward sign of righteousness, a public display of virtue. Above all, it embodies a transactional faith in which what you do for God determines what you receive from God. For the Amish community, or Nadine Collier, or Sarah Montana, or the hundreds of other people who are able to forgive right off the bat, it is worth wondering why. Do they do it out of fear? Or obligation? Or to show God and the world how good they are when every bone in their bodies is screaming rage and revenge? Now please understand, I am not in any way impugning the faith and integrity of these individuals. I don't know them. I don't know their faith. But what it does say about the rest, but what does it say about the rest of us who struggle with our pain, our hurts, and our anger, who struggle to forgive, which is most of us, is God hopping over us, refusing to forgive us in our strife? Do we count? Or are we doomed? Is God's love denied us because we got an F on the forgiveness exam? And what constitutes enough? What about a C minus? I mean, if we sort of forgive, but only half-heartedly, does God then give us a 50% portion of his love? Reese Witherspoon's character in the HBO series, Big Little Lies, says, I love my grudges. I tend to them like little pets. Well, maybe some of us haven't quite let our resentments off the leash yet. And so truthfully, I tell you, as a pastor in the Reformed Protestant tradition, I cannot abide the notion of a conditional faith. Whatever happened to salvation by faith, not works? Whatever happened to Christ's sacrifice for the forgiveness of all? Whatever happened to God's mercy and amazing grace? You see, in our tradition, we don't earn God's love. It is free by virtue of our faith and God's largesse. The rest of the journey is a series of trespasses and apologies, a sincere but imperfect effort to be like Jesus, and the assurance that God loves us in spite of it all. Now, I find it interesting that years later, Nadine Collier acknowledged to the press, while she's doing okay, she still hasn't quite reached the point of full acceptance when it comes to what happened to her mother. But each day, it's getting closer. We still haven't gotten the chance to grieve yet. 
Sometimes I have my moments. My mind just winds back as far as doing different things for my mom, but it hasn't got there. Sarah Montana reports in her early words of forgiveness came before understanding what she even wanted justice for. That it wasn't what happened to her family, but to her. That is what she needed to forgive. She recounts how the words, I forgive him, made everyone around her feel better. As in, good, can we all move on from this now? No, she finally said to the world, we cannot, because this is going to take time. I'm so comforted by Jesus in verses 6 through 8 of our reading. Whenever you pray, go into your room, and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you're praying, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard because of their many words. Don't be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. Friends, I don't know about you, but I am absolutely counting on God to know my heart, to hear my secret prayers and forgive my inability to forgive. This is the God I pray to every day in whose unconditional love I abide and whose amazing grace I humbly receive. So take heart on the journey. Amen.